Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to today's uh, Science of Slack employee lecture series. Um, it's my pleasure to uh, introduce today's speaker, um, CG Wong. Um, CG earned his PhD from UCLA, and uh, as far as I can tell, right afterwards, he went directly to Brookhaven National Lab and uh, spent a few decades there. And when he was there, uh, he conducted sort of you know, pioneering work on the generation of ultra short bunches of electrons and characterizing those bunches. And um, two years ago, he came to Slack to, um, to lead the ultra fast <coughs> electron diffraction and microscopy initiative. And in today's lecture, he's going to tell us about the rapid developments that are occurring in this program and uh, some of the first science results that are hot off the press. And, um, but before we begin, I'd just like to say, I mean, um, it's been really, you know, ever since ZG came, sort of like the, the happiness level at Slack kind of took a big bump because out of, out of all the, you know, he's one of these guys where he's always kind of laughing and smiling and in a good mood. And so um, I'm really happy that you're here, ZG, and we're looking forward to, to your lecture. Um, please join me in welcoming him. Thanks, Dave. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm CJ Wang from the Accelerator Director. So it's a great pleasure to give this uh, Science of uh, Slack lecture. The title of my lecture is Ultra-Fast Electrons, a View into Atomic World. So first, I'd like to take the opportunity to thank many colleagues to make it possible for these talks. And uh, many of them are present. And uh, there's a bunch of them, they didn't have a chance to take their pictures. So I also would like to send support we get from the financial support from the DOE BES facility visit accelerate R and D and detect R and D. And we get a lot of support from the you know Slack from the direct office on the you know program funding, Chijin Norbert and uh, Jiang and uh, Bob Hedo and uh, Leah Mike's and uh, Bill's many people support this project. And uh, it's really, this project really is a lab initiative. It's involved all the, you know, technical support from XR uh, technology. And uh, I would like to express acknowledge the support from the laser division from LTLS and the test facility divisions. So here's the outline of my talk. As you know, Slack is an electron lab, it's known as electron lab. Electron first used to probe the elementary particle world. In the last couple of years, the electron mainly used to produce X-rays to probe atomic world. Basically, I call it, you try to look at electrons, phonons, and protons, how to interact with each other. So X-rays are really powerful tools. There's another tool. It's electron itself. So you really want to have a full picture of the atomic world. You need both X-rays and uh, electrons. So the technology basically called ultra-fast electron diffraction and the microscopy. So this is the newest Slack initiative. So the heart of this is it's really the same technology to drive the XFEL. That's ultra-fast bright electron beams. So in this talk, I really would like to share with you what this initiative about and the first experiment result come out of this initiative. Basically, so we use the electron diffraction setup. We first look at the material science and then we look at the gas phase. Also, I would like to share a little bit about what are our future plans. So besides, we want to continue to improve the electron diffraction, I call it faster, faster in two things. One is the higher red rate. We are running 120, we are not running 180, we are going to go to 360s. Also in the time rate, fast electrons, from now 100 femtosecond down to 10 femtosecond, smaller, smaller means the electron probe on the sample. Now it's 100 micron, we are going to down to 5 microns, maybe in the future go to 10 nanometers. Also, we are initiating, you know, the 
R&D for the next generating instrument. That's a single shot ultra fast electron microscope. So with the current and the future development, besides the material science chemistry, we would like to open new scientific community in bioscience and uh, in warm dense matter physics. So here is, a, I guess, order the schematic of the SLAC lab. As you can see, the future highway now is known as a Highway 280s. And uh, the start of the lab is electrons. It has been used as a high energy physics probe to study you know, elementary particle physics. So electron has a unique properties. It's a elementary particles. It's everywhere. And uh, it has light. I'm talking about light. It's talk about the mass. It's a 10 to minus 31 kilogram. It's small. If you treat this electron as a point, it's a 10 to minus 15. And it's charged. So <coughs> electron also have a spin magnetic You said, uh, why this light small? Turn out, uh, just want to give you all the magnetic comparison, how small, how light it is. Our human being, we talk about the height is in the order of meters and the weight of 10 kilograms. And uh, you look at uh, this, is, it's a 31. So this is a really, you know, it's a 30 organ. You said, uh, you really don't have one mean 31. Just comparison with the end. This is about a seven meters. So the end compared to human being, the length is about a two of the magnitude. So we are about, a, you know, 15 order magnitude larger than electrons. And uh, if you look at the hairs, your human hair, the diameter is 100 micron. So this is a four order magnitude. So you can see for two of them, you can form an almost invisible. So this is 15, 31s. So here, you know, the physics is sometimes in one unit. For example, in standard, they said, you know, 9.131 kilogram, they use 0.5 MeVs. So that's a unit, they count, you know, how heavy the electron is. Also, they have some special, you know, for the nanos, 10 to minus 9, picos, 10 to minus 12, fentos is a 10 to minus 15. So basically, you can say the electron, the size is about the photometers. So that's give you a concept of size. And also the times. Here we talk about ultra fast electrons. So we basically talk about electron, the bunch length, shorter than picosecond. You said, what picosecond? Nanosecond light trend or about one feet, one foot, also, which is the right pronunciation. So now, one picosecond, it's a 0.3 millimeters, three odd magnitude shorter. So here we talk about electrons, it's a, about a even one odd magnitude shorter than femtoseconds. So the with electron, you know, light and the small, it have a some advantage. First advantage we use it as a slide to generate the microwaves. Because it's a light, you first generate electrons and uh, it will go through the cavities. It will basically call the modulation. Some can accelerate. The outgoing electrons is nearly equal to the energy of the incoming electrons. So once the electron modulate, they go through drift space, they function. So when electron bunch, they generate the so-called coherent radiations, so which is a proportion to the square of electrons. Because usually the electron involves not like a 10, 100, usually 100 millions, 10 to 9. So this coherent radiation really gives you a lot of power. And another important property is besides the electrons, the light can get bunching. It uh, can generate power, high power radiation because the radiation power, again, you light, you get more radiation, you easily go to high energies. And uh, here's acceleration, that's the magnetic field. So, you know, basically, the light 
charged small allow us to get a bunch of the high energy generate a lot of radiation. So that's basic the physics behind the FCLS. We generate a lot of light. And now the slag accelerator mainly used to actually for biology, material science, high energy physics, uh, high density physics. So this kind of world. If you go to the LCLS in you know, the website, you'll find the latest science highlight from high temperature TC to the Cambridge reaction to the biologist. One of the common theme in this science is the use actually to look at the electrons, phonons, protons, how to interact, how to the interact bring new properties. For example, you have phonons and electron interacting, you get the high temperature, you know, <coughs> high TCs you observe. So, you know, you say, what's the phonon? Phonon turns out is that you observe every day. It's related to mechanical heat property of material. And the electron, just like uh, you turn on the light, you get the electrons. And uh, turn out another important thing is uh, protons. And uh, turn out in uh, all the most important fundamental chemical reactions, you involved protons. So actually have done a wonderful job to look at those uh, how they interact in, in the biology system, in the you know, chemical process. But uh, there's a certain process, for example, our eye. We have a light hitting our eyes, and uh, this light did not convert it to heat, convert to electrical signal. This is called isomorphization. That's involved proton, nuclear movement. For this kind of movement, another there's a electrons more easily to detect. So this is like to look at, you know, what's the best technique to available to look at so-called proton transformation in a biological and uh, chemical reactions. So we think, you know, with the high brightness ultrafast electrons, they will open a new way to study this kind of biochemical science. Another important you know, the process is the uh, heat. As we know, electron, our, you know, the iPhones, all the electron device uh, getting smaller, smaller. Turn out the, one of the limit is the heat. Here a plot show, as you decrease size, the power density, heat density of the electron, it's uh, amazing, it's close to the nuclear power. So handling heat, it's really one of the, you know, challenge for the current technologies. So, as I mentioned before, the heat is related to the phonons. So turn out the, to look at how the phonon, you know, diffuse, transport in your materials. Again, electrons, it's a better, have a more sensitivity to look at the heat process. So now let's look at the, why electrons are good at look at the nuclear. Look at the phonons. That's because here you look at it. You have X-rays. He really probe an electron density of your atoms. Well, your electrons to look at the both electron and the nuclear. Here it's a look at the electrostatic potential. And because of electrons, look at the electron potential. The interaction cross section of electron usually is larger than the X-rays. Particles, yet they also behave like waves, similar to waves of light. The higher the energy of the electron, the shorter its wavelength becomes. It so at the beginning I said the electron is small, it's like a point, but all the you know, particles also is a wave. So there's a you know, wavelength associated with electrons. For example, when you have a 1 MeV electron, the wavelength is about the picometers. And uh, usually we talk about the X-rays, uh, Armstrongs. That's a 10 to minus 10. So this is a 10 to minus 12. So the wavelength associated with the electron is much shorter. That's what electron can see, the nuclear, the protons. And uh, you know. 
collect information about the atomic structure of the object that it passes through, just like X-ray waves reveal the inside of materials. Scientists to reconstruct the atomic arrangement in the sample. Because the electron beam consists of a train of very short, widely spaced bunches, researchers can also see ultra-fast changes in the material structure that occur in less than a trillion of a second, for instance, in response. So, now, you know, because of the electron, it's a wave, it's just like x-rays, you can go to diffraction, and uh, here you have the real space structures, you get the diffraction patterns. And uh, so, this is what uh, we call the imaging in the reciprocal space. And uh, so you always ask, like, if you can see electron directly, why I need a you know, reciprocal space? There are two things. One is technology challenge. For example, x-rays. It's very difficult to make optics to focusing the x-rays. There's also an advantage to work in the reciprocal space. Here's a simple illustration. You have an object through a lens, you can get an imaging both in real space imaging and the diffraction imaging. So in the diffraction imaging, you look at, the, at each image point, it signal comes from the different point. It's a basically look at the global average distribution of your structures. And it's more efficient because all the objects contribute to the signals and easily quantized. So well to the real space imaging, you look at the, this, the image point only have a contribution signal from the original point. So it's a really point to point. And uh, it's good to give you a local information, but it's less efficient. So when you basically we need a both reciprocal space, give you more efficient, and the real space give you local structures. So the electron can have advantage because it's a charged particles, you can focus in it. So it can work both at the diffraction, reciprocal space, and the real space imaging. So electron Mexico was uh, first introduced in the 1930s. And uh, since then, there's a three technology push the spatial resolution of electron Mexico down to this uh, basically atomic, you know, sub amstrongs And uh, these three technologies, uh, one is electron sources, and then you have the optics and the go to high energies. So as you all know, in the last couple of decades, with the development now, you have basically achieved the spatial resolution limit of electron microscope. What amazing about the electron microscope is the temporal, because all the electrons, all the phonons, all the protons are moving in your atomic system. So you only, not only need a spatial resolution, you also need a temporal resolution. That's why at SLAC, we start a ultra-fast electron scattering and diffraction and the microscopy initiative. So the goal of this initiative to you know, meet the challenge to bring the temporal resolution from the nanosecond down to picosecond, femtosecond. And uh, here it's the roadmap of SLAC UED UEM initiative. We are starting with a, you know, electron diffraction with the goal to develop an instrument with a hundred femtosecond temporal with a, you know sub Armstrong spatial resolutions. Then we move forward by reduce the probe of electron beam so we can get a local information. That's what we call the nano UEDs. Then in the future we would like to develop a single shot ultra-fast electron microscopy with a nanometer spatial and a picosecond temporal resolutions. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned earlier, so we need a both X-rays and the electron to look at the ultra-fast, ultra-small world. You know, X-ray is really good at the look at the electrons, while the electron is a look at the phonons and the light structures. So with both X-rays and the electrons, we now have uh, two of the most powerful probes. We can look at the same samples. For example, here is the, you know, <clears throat> iron planting, which is a future magnet storage materials. We look at the use of LTLS permanence group to look at the spin structures, and uh, at the UED, we can look at the light structures. 
And uh, there's another challenge in the XIPOs. Because of the success, and uh, there's a large user community who could not get beam time. So for example, with UED, especially look at the structure dynamics and the single shot beam physics, we can you know, help the LCLS to meet some you know, user demand. The most important with the new you know, technology, we can use the free electron laser as a pump by selecting different uh, you know, wavelengths, we call the K edges, to select the different chemicals. So we can bring the chemical selectivity into the play to study the structure dynamics. So one of the, my favorite example lately to say why we need both electrons and the X-rays uh, is uh, this example of the, to look at the you know, liquid waters, and uh, especially so-called the Noman regime. So in this uh, Noman land, you have basically two types, you know, high density or low density, you know, liquid. And uh, this have been looked at uh, in the storage ring. In the storage ring, they can get a very hard 40 keV X-rays. You can so-called Q range. That's where the so-called X-ray spatial resolutions. And uh, it's have been looked at in the LCLS. In this region, there's no time resolutions. In the LCLS, there's a great temporal resolution. There's not enough spatial resolutions. So we believe by you know, using ultra-fast electron diffraction, we will have both the spatial resolution needed and the temporal resolution. So to really answer you know, this fundamental question about the nomen's land, <coughs> about the liquid waters. So with this kind of science, so what kind of technology we want to use to develop this ultra-fast electron diffraction. Turn out the electron diffraction had been around for a while. In 1930, the first use to study the molecular structure in the gas phase. In the 80s, electron diffraction was first introduced by Jerome Moreau in the Rochester University. In there, he first proposed so-called photoelectron source. Basically, he used a Yag laser after frequency quadruple you generate a burst of electrons. The electron source you use is almost similar to your old you know, TV. It's about 20 keVs. So this is really the start of the photo electron sources, 20 keV. So use this electron source, they probe the melting, so-called of the you know, aluminum. And you can see the temporal resolution achieved in the first experiment. It's in the order of 10 picoseconds. So since then, many groups around the world try to improve the temporal resolution of the ultra-fast electron diffractions. And uh, three things happen. First, it's the lasers. Instead of Yag laser, have picosecond, now you have a Thai sapphire with a 10 femtosecond. So that brings, you have a temporal resolution of the laser. The next to improve of the electron source, electron guns, by design proper focus and uh, increase the electron beam energy from 20 keV to about 100 keV under the detections of the CCDs. And uh, so with these three improvement, the currently the ultra fast electron diffraction, it's a temporary resolution still limit to a hundredth femtosecond. That's mainly because electrons have a space charge. They do not like to stay together. Another limitation for the ultra-fast electron diffraction, especially the gas phase, so-called velocity mismatch. Basically, you have a photon which moves faster in the speed of light. You have electron move slower. In the low energy, because of the mismatch, you get the temporal resolution limit. So to eliminate this, that means you have to really go to high energies. And so I get started with uh, ultra-fast electron diffraction because 20 years ago, about 20 years, I did an experiment to measure the electron beam using a photocathode half gun. We generate about a 5 MeV electron beam. But one of the things uh, the electron I produced in the experiment is a 40 picocoulombs. So when I submit the paper to PRLs, they said that, you know, the charge is low. Look like it's a very, you know, not useful for future IPO applications. 
So that's where I said, okay, instead of 40 people, we read to a 10 to 8 electrons, but it's the same you know, number of electrons. Then we said, uh, what kind of application can do? There are the ultra fast electron diffraction, which use people column. And it's, uh, this is more than enough charge to use for the ultra fast electron diffraction. So since then, many groups using this technique to look at the ultra fast diffractions. We know with high energy, you can get a temporal resolution. There are questions about whether you have signals weak, whether you have sample damage. Are they really useful to study ultra fast uh, you know, physics and chemistries? So first thing you talk to MEV people, look at this picture. Basically, you have a 10-story you know, 3 MEV electron microscope. And uh, you said, OK, they are really big, expensive. The first thing we said, OK, we can replace traditional electron source with the called photocathode of gum, which is about uh, 10 centimeters. To the production of a high quality beam of very energetic electrons based on the technology developed by Slack for LCLS. This is done inside an electron gun, where a laser pulse heats a piece of metal known as a photocathode and evaporates electrons from the metal. This incredibly short bunch of electrons is then accelerated by a radio frequency field toward the exit of the gun, where a magnet focuses consecutive bunches into a narrow beam. So the photocathode really involves three technologies. First, it's accelerated technology. Slag is a, you know, well known about. It. So compared to the traditional slag accelerator structure, we use a field gradient about the 10 to 20 megawatt per meter. In the photocathode arc gun on the castle, we have field that's about 100 megawatt. Magnitude. So that will basically give you all the magnitude higher field. What that does is to go to higher electron beam energies. Like I mentioned before, electron charge particles, they do not like to stay together. But when they are moving, so then you generate a magnetic field. So this magnetic field make them attract each other. So this uh, magnetic field will cancel the space charge effect the cancellation is proportional to the beta square, which is the speed of electron and energies. So that's one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, electrons are light, charged particles, so you can easily accept to higher speed, higher energies to reduce the space charge effect. The second technology using photocathode is the lasers. Laser use to control both the temporal and the spatial distribution of electron beam. So you can produce very short picosecond down to femtosecond electron bunches. And the last note is the castle technology. By properly match your laser with your castle, you can improve the quality of electron beams. So with this technology in hand, we want to do an experiment to set up, demonstrate the usefulness of ultra-fast electron diffraction. So here's the side of the slack, and we are here at this uh, Kavli auditorium. So at the building 44, where the classroom you know, is, there's a bunker called uh, you know, accelerated structure testing area. In there, there's a laser, and there's a backup gun for the LCLS. So we take advantage of those infrastructure. We start in the ultra-fast electron diffraction experiment. So this is the bunker we cleaned in the fourth week of uh, last June. And uh, since then, first, we installed a new air condition in our laser room. As you can see from the laser room temperature, laser AC was uh, turned on in the fourth week of August. So since then, our laser people have you know, improved, recommissioned our laser system. And uh, here's the <laughs> schematic of the laser used for the ultra-fast electron diffraction. So the laser is a traditional, you know, femtosecond laser can produce about 40 femtosecond, 40 femtosecond uh, pulses. And uh, this laser pulse is sent to the bunker. There we divide it into two parts. The first part, we frequency triple to generate UV to hit the castles to generate the electrons. The second part goes to the OPAs, so we can tune the wavelengths from the infrared to the, you know, uh, infrared to the ultraviolet. 
So it's used as a pump. So this is our pump pro experiment. Another technology we adopt is uh, the synchronization between the laser and the RF system. Use the technology developed here, we improve the jitter from 100 femtosecond down to 10 femtosecond. And uh, we first install the optical tables, the photocathode RF guns. We build uh, the sample chambers and the complete commission the, of the UED setup. And uh, in August 22nd, we see our first electron beam last year. And uh, within a week, we see our diffraction from the single crystal gold and the polycrystal from bismuth. So since then, we have been using this uh, ultra-fast electron diffraction to study the materials. So the material we have been looking at is a nano system such as bismuth, iron platens, and uh, nano coarse gold. We also look at the two-dimensional materials. And uh, so we are also now recently starting to look at the strongly quality systems. So in the next couple of minutes, I would like to give you a little bit of detail the experiment we have done in the material science. The first experiment we look at is the diffuse scattering. And uh, as you know, when you have a perfect mirror, you have light come in, will come out, and they have uh, exact same angles. When you have a defect in the mirrors, you get the so-called diffuse scattering. And uh, so most time, you know, you say that this is bad because diffuse scattering is uh, related to the defect of your materials. Same thing, you look at the crystals, atomic structures. When you have a perfect crystal, you have a, you know, electron coming, you get the diffractions, and then diffraction, you, these bright spots, this is uh, called the black peaks. But if you have a defect between those, uh, you know, crystals, and uh, you cause diffuse scattering, those are the between of the, your two bright peaks. And most time when you study the diffraction, you like look at these beautiful structures. But it turns out between those black peaks, there's a lot more information. This is a phonon where like. So and uh, I also know, you know, the impurity is how the material, the new material works. For example, when you have a high TC, what you do, you dope different impurity to improve the temperatures. So it's really important to, besides the, to look at the black peaks, look at between the black peaks. That's where the diffuse scattering, you know, come in. For us, it's diffuse scattering, look at the, it's uh, two things important. Like I mentioned, when we first proposed MEV electron diffraction, people always said, is this signal strong enough? Second, do you have noise? Do you have a signal to, you know, to noise ratio large enough to look at the most interesting physics? So diffuse scattering really help us uh, two things. Because it's in between the black peaks and they are weak, and the second is, uh, since weak and the signal no ratio is always issues. So the first system we look at is uh, gold. And uh, you know, actually people really like a diamond, but we like a gold because uh, you can buy commercially perfect crystals. And uh, we're using laser heating the gold. Then we look at the, you know, these are the black peaks. Look at between the black peaks how the diffuse scattering you know, evolved. And this is two picosecond after you laser hitting the samples, eight picosecond, 50 picosecond. You look at, at the beginning, there's nothing between the bracket. As time evolves, there's more structure, stress show up. That's where the phonons, and also around the bracket peaks. So we did a you know, comparison between our experiment at the 50 picosecond and the simulation. And around the bracket, you see a very good agreement. You said, okay, what you learn from this process? 
So you know, one of the things we talk about so under the heat, how the you know heat propagates in materials. You have a laser heating material, force electron quickly heat up, then cool down to with the phonon lattices. We learned that the bright peak and uh, it's much slower than the phonons between the, you know, the black peaks. So there's a much more dynamic process than we saw. And the second example is the uh, 2D materials. Rob, you know, about the 2004, you heard the peel, you know, scotch revolution. People peeled eugenic graphene. Graphene have uh, some wonderful properties. It's a uh, hundred times stronger than steel, have uh, no resistance, have all the optical properties. But graphene has some defect that is it cannot make semiconductor. They do not have the energy structure you look at. So lately people have been looking at the new material called the molybdate sapphires. This have uh, besides the wonderful property graphene, it can make a uh, semiconductor. And uh, by you know the light you can switch from uh, semiconductors to a metals. So, you know, these are uh, wonderful materials and we want to look at the mechanical property. So the property we look at is a, it's a graph in single mono layers. We look at the light shining on these, uh, you know, materials. Basically, that's the material and uh, here the diffraction patterns. And uh, we want to look at this How one light shining, how this this model layer changes by deformation because you can control the electrical optical properties. So we observe, you know, there's a in-plane and out-plane deformations, and uh, over the mailing cycles, this material can you know restore itself, have a wonderful mechanical property, and. Uh, we also observe there's a large deformations. That means we can control the electrical optical properties using the lasers. So this work, you know, was uh, recently published in the uh, nanoliters. So besides the you know condensed matter physics, ultrafast material, we look at, and the next challenge is uh, to look at the gas phase uh, molecular chemical dynamics. And uh, you always ask uh, questions, so why gas? We are living in a gas environment, and uh, there's, uh, you know, we have sunlight, we have uh, the CO2s, all this, uh, you know, process involved, how photons interacting with uh, gas molecules. From a technology point of view, there's a very, you know, interesting thing is uh, gas is uh, much isolated. You do not look at the uh, between the molecule interaction, so it's a relatively simple system. So you can easily to have a, you know, theoretical models to compare with uh, your experiment. And uh, for the gas experiment, the most important challenge is weak signals. In the condensed matter, your electron interacting with a sample whose density is uh, 10 to 23 you know, atoms per centimeter cubic. In the gas, you're talking about 10 to 17. So that's the five, six, all the molecule, less molecule. So the signal is uh, much weaker. So in this experiment, and uh, we look at the three, you know, molecular systems, and uh, we have successfully, you know, demonstrated we have a femtosecond temporal resolution. And uh, here's the experiment set up for our gas phase UED. And you have a gas nozzle, which is a pulse at 120 hertz. Then you have a laser, which is a pump for exciting your molecules. The excited pump molecule is probed by electron beams and detect by our you know, detectors. So the first thing we will look at is nitrogen. You know, I was prepared to talk Turns out one of the things really is a nitrogen, liquid nitrogen used for the food to cooling and to improve our, you know, the taste of your hamburgers. But here we choose nitrogen because it's simple and it's abundant. And the physics we are look at is called quantum revival. 
When you have a random nitrogen gas, you have a laser, which have an electric field. What does is uh, all the nitrogen molecule will align by this external field. Because the laser is very short, it's a 40 femtosecond, it quickly disappears. What happens? So when your laser disappears, this aligned molecule start in so-called quantum revival vibration process. And here is a complete quantum process. And uh, here show the simulation and uh, take about eight picosecond, you get a revival. And uh, we want to look at this to verify the temporal and the spatial resolution of the UED we developed. So here's the experiment result. And uh, before your laser arrive aligned molecule, you get a diffraction pattern, basically uniform isotopy. And with uh, aligned, now you get uh, this diffraction patterns. So the red is experiment data, and the blue is the simulation. So from here you can see, we experiment observe the nitrogen molecule full revival within eight picoseconds. So from this so-called uh, full aligned, anti-aligned, the time separation is about uh, 300 femtosecond. So by clearly look at the diffraction pattern at these two locations, which give us a temporal resolution about uh, 100 femtosecond RMS. So because, like I said, gas molecule is uh, simple, and uh, we can do a Fourier transfer. We look at diffraction pattern in reciprocal space. By Fourier sum, we can get a real space at aligned location and uh, at anti-aligned, and uh, compare this with the simulation. So we have uh, get a really a good agreement. So in the nitrogen, in a quantum revival experiment, we experimentally demonstrate 0.7 Armstrong's spatial 100 femtosecond temporal resolutions. So my friend will tell you, OK, you are not really look at the chemical reaction. You just look at the you know, molecule orientations. So next experiment we look at is the iodines. You know, iodine is known as a purple. And uh, when you become a gas, and uh, you get purple colors. So why iodine? Iodine have a relative long bound length among all molecules. It's heavier, so usually a little bit slower, so we can easily to study the chemical reaction. So in the iodine experiment, we look at this, to look at this uh, bond length change. So basically, you look at two atoms, two nuclear, between the distance, their movement. Here are illustrations, and after you excite it, and uh, you can see the bond lines, and uh, you, at different time, will evolve. So in the IOD experiment, we basically want to look at the bond lines change as a function of time. Here's the experiment result, and uh, here's simulation. After about a hundred femtosecond, we exciting the iodines. We measure the two nuclear, you know, distribution of the iodine molecules, and uh, we will be able to the first time to look at the two nuclear, you know, coherent oscillations. And uh, now we try to follow this bound lines as a function of time. And uh, here's the time evolution, time. This is a spacing between two iodine atoms. And this is a simulation. As you can see, before time zero, you get a constant. Then you see oscillation. And uh, here's the measurement of the iodine bound lines as a function of time. So this, you know, to the first time, we can look at inter, you know, molecule, the, you know, bond, you know, bond vibrations. The last, not the least, the molecule we look at is uh, called the nitrous dioxide. 
and most people will say it's a laughing gas, and uh, it's sweet, so people in the party. But uh, we look at them, our friend Ryan told me it's because this is the simplest molecule can simulate biomolecules. Basically, he told me is if you distort this molecule, they have called the John Tyler effect, which is the same as all the you know biomolecules. So by look at this molecule, provide a you know sample system to understand the you know biomolecule reactions. So why we want to look at this? Because at Slack, we are unique position. We have X-rays. We can use soft x ray to look at energy structures, and we have ultra fast uh, lasers to look at the, you know, the optical property of this molecule. Now we have UED. This is an experiment data to look at the structures. So by looking at the energy optical structures, we can have a you know, complete picture how this molecule evolved after your you know, optical pump. So, you know, in the last uh, you know, 40 minutes, I give you an overview, you know, what's the ultra-fast electron diffraction microscopy initiative is about, what we have done. But, you know, we are want to continue to improve. As you can see, this roadmap was pretty much accomplished the first step. Next step is we want to go to nano UED. That means we want to reduce the probe size. And uh, we also want to go to faster, you know, higher rep rates. We want to start with ultra fast electron imaging initiative. So long term wise, we want to build the UED farms. So this is the concept basically we have multiple UED which optimized for material science, chemistry, biologists, and to support different user communities. So I want to quickly show you the latest experiment result that we call the microfocusing. In this experiment, we basically to look at a, a organic paraffin molecule. The crystal size about 10 microns. So when we have electron beams, about 30 microns, we get this ring-like structure diffraction. This people usually call the you know, polycrystal type. As we decrease our electron probe from 30 to 5 microns, we have a high quality single diffractions. To realize that, we need two things. The most things are electron beam qualities. So we have now an electron beam quality with the emittance in the order of 3 nanometers. So that's why we can achieve these high quality diffractions. So with the improvement of the electron beam, the next science opportunity we look at is uh, bioscience. And uh, here's uh, the first diffraction from biomolecule necros. This uh, molecule people told you know, relate to some disease. So we are not there yet compared to LCLS, but we can see some basic different structures. In order to solve this structure, now we need to improve the cube, the spatial resolution of a UED by factor two to four. So we know how to do it. First, we want to improve our detectors. Currently, we use a phosphor screen which have a spatial resolution of about 100 microns. We can use so-called direct electron detector developed by Berkeley and other folks. We can get all the micro improve on the detector resolution. Second, we want to improve the electron beam you know, qualities. So you know, we have been working with the uh, uh, groups. You know, we think electron, besides bringing a new you know, capability in temporal resolution, it also maybe have less radiation damage than the X-rays. So we are really excited to look at you know, how to explore the UED, UEM for bioscience applications. And uh, you know, look at the future, the image. You know, like I said, current electron microscope have a wonderful spatial resolution. 
both improve, need to improve its temporary version. So the user community by tell us is, we want an ultra fast electron microscope can keep the spatial resolution while you improve the temporal resolution. So working with our biology community said, what kind of microscope can really truly you know, have an impact in biology? Basically, they want to have an atomic spatial. That means better than 0.3 nanometer spatial. It's about fast enough. How fast your electron pulse length shorter than nanosecond, so you can avoid the tumbling time of the molecules. You get a clear picture. With such a kind of capability, so you should be able to take the image of your biomob in the natural environment. So in the you know, natural environment. And uh, so how to realize such a you know, instrument and we are basically says to can using higher electron beam energies to reduce space charge and improve electron source use super conducting arc guns and uh, adopt the novel you know electron optics basically our XRP called the lattice to reduce the chromatic aberrations so with this and uh, I would like to stop and thank you very much. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. So one question I had is, uh, is this a, um, a user facility now? And if so, can, can anyone apply for beam time? It's not yet, though. It's a, we are still in the R&D phase. One of the you know, unique features mm -hmm. of uh, current is uh, we directly working with users. For example, we starting with uh, like a 2D materials. We really don't know whether we have enough you know, signal to look at this. Working with the iron group, so we continue to improve our detectors. And the same thing on the gas. So it's uh, more like R&D. When, when do you think it'll transition? This is a... Uh, well, depend on a lot of funding and but the one thing we hope is uh, we can develop a you know UED farm which will be a user facility and uh, I personally very hope this can be operational in the dark period of LCLS in 2019 and uh, so to support huh? 18. 18 yeah that, oh, okay <laughs> so. Because uh, we, we think uh, you know, that would be truly you know, helpful for the user community. Is there a conceptual design at least for building a bunker like this out by the hutches for LCLS so you can bring x-rays to the same sample at the same time as the electron beam? Yeah, that's the thing we have been trying to you know, work on. And we really think uh, we can install UED at the FTLS will be unique. For example, actually to start the warm dense matter, you can much more uniform the pump. And the electron can look at both electron ion. The challenge is the space. Yeah. And I didn't notice, are uh, the guns that you're working with now, are they S-band like LCLS or are they X-band technology? They are exactly LCLS gun. It's a LCLS backup gun. Yeah, thanks. Maybe we have time for one more. So at the beginning you gave this nice overview over the electron properties and you mentioned that there's also the electron spin. Can you do spin dependent measurements with polarized beams? Currently, you know, it's uh, not, but uh, there's a R&D effort at Japan using DC gun, low energy and uh, People working in the collider here know people have been trying to generate polarize the electron in the arc gun. There are some challenge. Currently, we not. Okay, let's thank CJ.
We are working on that. 